Good morning and welcome to day two of the SHOT Show. I'm Larry Keene, Senior Vice President and General Counsel for the National Shooting Sports Foundation. And I'm joined here this morning with Acting ATF Director Marvin Richardson. Marvin, thank you for coming to the SHOT Show. Definitely, thank you, Larry. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really, uh, we, we were talking before they started rolling the camera. This year is a very special year for ATF. Why don't you tell the audience what, what this year represents? Yes, it is. Actually, this year represents our 50th anniversary as an independent bureau. So uh, history tells us to go back to 1972, ATF was a part of the IRS. And in July of 1972, ATF was birthed out of IRS to become an independent bureau uh, to enforce uh, the laws and the uh, and the statutes uh, dealing with the federal firearms uh, authorities and the explosive authorities, arson uh, crimes. And so here we are today, 50 years later, uh, doing that and regulating uh, both industries in a way that I think is unique to ATF. So we're, uh, we're excited about it. It's an opportunity for us to really uh, demonstrate, you know, uh, how we've grown as an organization over the past 50 years. So we're excited. So we're very thankful that ATF comes to the SHOT Show. And as uh, people don't may not know this, but the ATF booth at the SHOT Show is the busiest booth on the show floor by far because we have all the dealers that are here and they have an opportunity to talk with ATF yes. and ask compliance-related questions and get input and information and make sure they're following the law correctly. Right. So thank you very much for, for being here. You know, through the history of ATF and the industry, and particularly through your leadership, you know, the relationship between NSSF and the industry and ATF has, I think, really grown stronger yes. through a lot, of, a lot of hard work on both sides to find yep. common ground. And we don't always agree, obviously, yeah, but, but we try to, you know, when we disagree, to, to disagree in a professional manner. Right. And that's, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. Definitely. But we have a number of programs we work on together now, some yes. of them, you know, a couple of decades old. Right. And we're really proud of those, and we think it's really important to collaborate on those efforts. Uh, probably the, the one we have been doing the longest is Don't Lie for the Other Guy. Yes. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about what Don't Lie for the Other Guy is about? So Don't Lie has been an association that we've uh, actually partnered with NSSF for about the past 20 years now. Uh, it's been, a, I think, a great partnership when we start talking about our efforts to combat, you know, uh, diverting firearms from legal commerce to illegal commerce, right? So don't lie basically means just that, right? So a straw purchaser, an individual who uh, is otherwise not prohibited would purchase a firearm for an individual who is prohibited, right? And that's where we say right there, that's where when that straw purchase occurs, the lie has taken place, right? And that right. lie leads to a violation of the federal firearms right. laws. And as a result, there's a criminal violation there which we would investigate um, because straw purchasing is still a very active form of firearms diversion from legal to illegal commerce. Right. And so when we start talking about our role as an agency in enforcing the federal firearms laws, uh, the partnership, you know, couldn't be any, uh, any any greater right there because that's actually the first line of defense. When you talk about uh, that 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 person who works at the store counter, right? That person is the first opportunity to stop that illegal activity from occurring, and so it's okay, right? I think that we've had great uh, great opportunities to interact with the industry and to talk about what it means to be able to say no to a sale because something doesn't seem right. And right. that's happened, you know, uh, more often than not. And then our partnership working together uh, on the Don't Lie program, that has been the emphasis to make sure that people understand that it's okay when you notice something is not right, say no. Right. And, you know, as, as you say, the, the dealer is on the front line right. and is a partner with law enforcement in stopping illegally, uh, the guns being illegally transferred to prohibited persons through, through straw purchasing. There's not very much that the industry can do about you know, somebody breaking into somebody's car right. or their house and stealing a gun. Right. But something that goes on inside you know, licensed premises, we can try to have uh, an effort through education, awareness, and training. And I think it's, you know, we always stress that it's an illegal straw purchase. Right. It isn't an illegal sale if the dealer doesn't know or right. should know that it's an illegal purchase. So. Right. And so our, the, the, the campaign is two parts, right? right? Is to help ATF to educate and yes. train the retailers. And we 
provide training material to retailers to do that. And then the, the other part of it is the public awareness campaign, right? right? Where yes. we try to get the word out to the would-be straw purchaser long right. before they ever walk into a gun store that it's a serious crime. Yes. And so, you know, we've do, been doing, um, you know, campaign launches. We did two this year, yes. right? Or within exactly. the past Chicago year. In Miami. In Miami, right? Yes. And uh, Chicago. And so we have public, you know, public service announcements to get the word out, paid for by, by NSSF. And it's been a great, great program. And as ATF often says, the retailers are the number one source of information that leads to ATF trafficking investigations. Right. Yes. So it's an important partnership. You know, again, the dealers are on the front lines yes. and they take their role very seriously. And yes. don't lie, it's very welcome by the retail community. Definitely in those areas, as you indicated, sometimes we'll see a rise in violent crime. And one of the things that we know is there is a diversion act taking place there. And whether it's, uh, whether it's through an FFL burglary or through straw purchases, we know that there are avenues through which firearms are being diverted from legal commerce to illegal commerce. And the, the more we can get that knowledge out there uh, on the front end, of that kind of, of, of a surge in violent crime, the better it is, right? Because we're putting people on notice, you know, that we know the activity is occurring and we're monitoring it. And when we catch you, uh, we, well, will, we will prosecute. So you mentioned, you know, uh, burglaries of gun stores. That's another yes. partnership program that, right. Great segue. that the industry has uh, engaged with ATF on a more recent vintage, but, but also equally important uh, to the Don't Like campaign. Tell the audience what that program is, what's it called, and what's what's the aim? So sure, we've worked, I think, uh, probably going on, what, about maybe six or eight years now mm -hmm. with Operation Secure Store, uh, another uh, great venture, I think, in which we're able to partner. Uh, one of the things that you have to always understand, right, ATF's statutory and regulatory authority it does have limits, right? And one of those limits is we don't have any statutory or regulatory authority to really talk about how an individual FFL secures or protects their premises. But in partnership with, uh, with NSSF over the years, uh, we have looked at those trends in which we've seen, you know, um, FFLs being victimized, you know, through burglaries and robberies, and we've shared that information. And so the program in and of itself really was established to educate um, the, the right. FFL community right. about how to avoid uh, being a victim, becoming a victim. So I think some of the, the education, the awareness, the training, uh, the recommendations, I know that uh, your guys, we work with yeah, them, our, yeah. our, our guys in criminal enforcement, uh, have an opportunity to sit down sometime to really talk about what it is that they are passing on. And it helps us to understand the, the message, right? So messaging, we sit down together, at least on an annual basis, to talk about what those trends and what that analysis mm -hmm. looks like so that you can then pass that on to the FFL community about what to look out for, right. how to improve their security posture. Because again, you know, when you start talking about a livelihood, you know, a burglary uh, of an FFL makes that FFL a victim, and a victim in more than one ways, right? They're a victim of a crime, number one, but they're also a victim in which, in instances where there's no insurance or things of that nature, right. they're, they're in jeopardy of being out of business. Yeah, so part of that program is when ATF response to every burglary, yes. which is terrific, uh, and works with the FFL to identify what guns were stolen. And then often is the case, ATF puts out a reward offer, yes. and NSSF is part of our, our Joint Operation Secure Store program. We match that reward offer, yes. uh, and hopefully that will lead to information that will uh, you know, result in the arrest and prosecution of those responsible. And right. importantly, yes. um, the recovery of those firearms so that they don't get into the black market and get used to commit crimes, which, which nobody wants. Yeah. Well, and we know without question that uh, anytime there's an FFL burglary, those firearms are automatically going to be diverted to the illegal market and they're going to be used in crimes, usually in the same community in which they are stolen. So that first 48 hours of any investigation is vitally important to be able to obtain uh, actionable information and intelligence to be able to initiate an investigation and resolve the crime. So when we start talking about, again, you know, getting that kind of information from the FFL, and, and in many instances, when you have um, uh, security cameras, things of that nature that give us the ability to look at that footage to see 
how entry was made to see individuals and maybe get a description of those individuals. And then when it comes down to it, you mentioned the reward. Obviously, when we feel like we are on the verge of really being able to get there but need that much more information, it is something that we use as an incentive, and the fact that, uh, that, that NSSF matches that uh, obviously puts a little more behind, uh, behind right. it so that we're able to you know, get that information that is so vital to, to the well, investigation. And that's the one check I don't mind writing. Right? <laughs> so if it leads to right. you know, yes. capturing the bad guys. Right. So, so if you're a dealer and you want to learn more about Operation Secure Store, just, Secure Store, just go to our website, and you can arrange to have a do a self audit or have a, a store security professional come out and audit your business and, and give you recommendations about how you can make your facility more secure, less vulnerable to burglary. And so the trend lines on yes. me smash and grab burglaries and the number of guns stolen, how have they been progressing o over time? So here lately, the good thing is we've seen that trend line start to go down. And in fact, as late as yesterday, you know, I, I get reports of every FFL burglary. An FFL burglary to ATF is kind of like a bank robbery right. is to the FBI, right? Yeah. right? So <laughs> we literally worked that investigation from cradle to grave. I mean, from the time that we get notification, we respond to 100% of those burglaries and we investigate them. And I think that the, the, the thing that's, that's important about that is that we see that that is a crime in which the FFL is a victim. And as a result of that, you know, we treat it just like any other crime, and we, we work at that thing 100% to make sure that we can um, secure those firearms that have gotten, uh, gotten out and to make sure that we keep them off the streets. So it's very encouraging to see that through this uh, educational effort and campaign, the, not, the instances of burglaries has, has been going down pretty significantly over time. You know, 2020 was an outlier, yes. and even if you look at the data for 2020, as I understand it, right. one month in, in particular was bad. If you took that one month out, yes. even 2020 was, you know, the trend was continuing yes. in the right direction. We're very proud of that, and we want to, you know, keep pushing in that yes. direction. So that's that's really terrific. And I think equally as important, uh, as you indicated, you know, when we see that trend going down, even in the downward trend, we'll see the attempted burglary. And that, to Good me, point. again, that's another great sign that the information is getting out there, that the industry is, is receiving that information, that the FFL community is implementing those uh, those different security measures to really protect. But when I see a when I see an FFL burglary report come in where it's an attempt and they didn't get anything, that lets me know, okay, that yeah. communication is working, the word is getting out there. And though we don't have any statutory authority to say put a lock on this door, put a camera here, do this, do that, I think in, again in partnership, that message getting out there and then the results being right. communicated uh, really does show that there's a great need uh, for that to continue. And as we see that trend line go down, I think that what we're seeing is we're seeing a compliance in a way that is not necessarily being regulated, right? It's one that right. is self-compliance. Well, it's, you know, we encourage retailers to make, a, you know, make the investment in your own store, in your own security. You know, if your inventory is stolen, you can't yes. sell it, right? So, right. so <laughs> you have a, you know, a uh, economic self-interest in, in taking those measures they don't have to be extraordinarily expensive things like smash resistant display right. cases. If you have enough, you know, you can store them in a gun safe. Uh, if you can, put bars on the window, gates right. on the door. You know, we still see attempts that are very aggressive, right? I mean, right. they're driving trucks through walls and, and uh, putting chains on gates and, and pulling them right off uh, of the door. But it's a matter of time, yes. right? You want to build time, slow them down. Right have an alarm and, and give the local police the opportunity to respond right. uh, and, and maybe catch them in the act. Yes. But as you say, the number of, of uh, failed attempts uh, or is increasing, which is a really good sign right. that, that the message is getting out there to the retailers. Yes. So that's, that's terrific. Thanks. Very proud of that, that campaign as well. So ATF has uh, had some big, bold initiatives recently. Um, you know, there, we had some fits and starts, but hopefully um, things are now going. You, you, the end of last month, you rolled yes. out e <laughs> Yes. So tell us about that. How is it going and, and what can the industry expect from 
the new e-form system. Well, excellent, uh, excellent, uh, and I appreciate you asking. So I always like to give credit where credit is due. So obviously, you know, one of the things that we've talked about over the years is our services platform, right? And so we, we provide a customer service to, uh, to the industry in the form of licensing, uh, whether it's imports, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, NFA. And so those services were built on a platform, right? And that platform was 1990s technology. Uh, so when we talk about that, the best way that I can probably describe it is, you know, think about having an iPhone 2 and an iPhone 13. <laughs> both iPhones, but both of them are totally different animals with regards to the capacity and the ability that they have uh, to, to perform. So we literally, the, the, the old platform was, was that, that technology that was really antiquated. And so this wasn't just a lift and shift. This was a complete rebuild of the services platforms. And I think, again, I give credit where it's due. Uh, we had this conversation back in 19, listen to me, back in 2018 yeah. and 2019. And I appreciate, I know there were some efforts to make sure that we were able to secure the funding for the rebuild. Uh, but it was mutually beneficial. So I believe that when we talk about being able to do that multi-year project, you can't do it without the funding. So we're able to secure that funding and the rebuild now, which was launched December 23rd, it's almost like one of those, it's like a birthday, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I remember it, it's like, uh, that was the, the launch date. And we put an entire new services platform uh, to work. And you know, like anything else, uh, the rollout initially had a few bumps in the road but the capacity and the improvements for, uh, from an industry perspective when we talk about uh, timeliness and right. everything that it's going to provide uh, to the industry and to, and, and to us as a, as, as a regulator are just phenomenal. Well, people may not know this, but you just mentioned it, that NSSF works to secure additional appropriation funding from Congress to provide the customer service that the industry needs to conduct business. And so eForms is a great example yes. of that. We, you know, it's, you know, you go into congressional offices and say, we want more money for ATF. <laughs> Sometimes you get some strange looks, but, but we need ATF to have the resources to provide the customer service to industry members that we yes. represent in order to their conduct business. And eForms is a great example of that. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about the wait times on like Form 4s, for example. Yep. They, you know, processing the paper took a lot of time. The right. increase in volume right. drove backlogs. What can we expect now on wait times as we progress into using e-forms? So if you think about any modernization effort, right? So uh, what we're able to do, if I, I'll, I'll kind of reckon backwards, the e-form 4473, right? right? It gave us the ability to really give you an opportunity to perform uh, a business function on a 21st century level, right? I mean, Writing things out yeah, by yeah. hand is not exactly 21st century technology. So that's what the e-form uh, 4473 did, right. right? So now that was to the GCA what e-form 4 is to the NFA. Right. It's again, it's a transfer form, but it gives us the ability now to cut out a lot of the process that was involved yeah. in touch points of paper going from A to B to C to D, right? So now with the electronic format, uh, we're able to look at conducting you know, those, uh, those transfers, and our, we, we have a performance goal of 90 days. Now, it's going to take yeah. us a minute, right, because right now we're dealing with a backlog of the paper forms from the old process. So the key is to get those processed, to get that, that backlog out of the way, but at the same time, we're, we're accepting right. on the eForms platform those new, uh, those new forms, and they are being processed with a whole lot more timeliness yeah. just because we don't have to go through a lot of the touch points. There's still parts in the process where we still don't have the kind of control, like we don't control the background uh, part that goes through, uh, uh, through, through the FBI. Right. But we are finding that, that, create, that just having that electronic process creates other efficiencies. Obviously, the fingerprint forms are now electronic. Right. So all of that, those submissions, even uh, that go over to the FBI and to other entities, it, it expedites that process for us because there's no longer this paper transfer. Right, and you know, even on the FBI side, the growth in e-checks has been yes, tremendous. It's been huge. I mean, I'm probably dating myself, but I remember when they first rolled it out and like it, was, it wasn't widely accepted. And I remember talking yes. to ATF years ago with, with Director Sullivan at the time about why can't we have electronic 4473s? <laughs> like, come on. Right. Like, and that was many iterations of the iPhone ago, right? right. So, yes, it was. There you so, go. Exactly. Uh, and in fact, we're having meetings with uh, industry meetings and companies are meeting with, with uh, 
FBI this week about yes. integrating into their point of purchase software system, yes. the eCheck, so it's, it's completely automated and speeds things up for everybody involved. So technology can really answer a lot of issues and improve yes. customer service across the board, both from the industry to the customer and the interface between industry uh, and the government, ATF, and the FBI as well. You so. know, and, and probably just to give you a little bit of an example of the improvements uh, on the platform. Now, on the old platform, usually we'd get up to about 90 users, 90, 90 wow. users, and it would get shaky. Yeah. Uh, you got up to about 110 users, and it would literally shut down. And that's a two hour restart, and then you had to you know, begin again, right? Well, starting on uh, December 23rd, we were seeing volumes of upwards of 3,000 uh, yeah. people getting online into the system at a time. At, at some points, as many as 1,200 in an hour. Yeah. That's about a 1,400% increase in productivity. That's so, like going from dial-up to high-speed internet, right? <laughs> exactly, right, so, so when you start, yeah. Before I let you go, I just want to touch on um, two quick things. What would you uh, estimate the timing is for publication of final rules on stabilizing arm braces and on the frame or receiver proposed rule? So yeah, so those are uh, those were obviously uh, published in the uh, in the Federal Register last summer, and uh, and in both instances, you know, we've gone through a huge process: two hundred ninety-seven thousand plus comments on the frame and receiver rule, and about two hundred and thirty something thousand. Uh, comments on the uh, on the arm brace rule. Right now, uh, I believe that we're scheduled for a release of the uh, of the rule sometime around June for the uh, for the frame and receiver around June of this year, and probably later in in August or September for the arm brace ruling. But the good thing about that is, and we've always had this discussion, right? Uh, Any time that there is a change that needs to be made, a major change. To, to something that is statutory. If we're gonna try and do it in the regulatory arena, we have to go through that APA process, right? And the Administrative Procedures Act lays out a prescription by which we need to go through to make sure that there's public notice and comment. And so we're able to take into account all of that information when we're formulating the new rule and it's done in an atmosphere in which it is visible to the public. So you can always go to the Federal Register, you can look and you can see because all those comments have to be addressed, they have to be answered, they have to be published. And so people can see what it is that we're looking at and the answers that we're providing uh, to those particular questions. And I just think again for us, you know, we've always talked about if you're going to do it, do it in a format in which everyone has an opportunity to have some input. Right. And then once that input is taken into account, we formulate those rules, we put them back out there, uh, they go through another formalization process in which they actually become active. It's usually about 90 days after uh, the rule right, is Well, that was my next final. question, particularly here on the frame receiver rule, because that will create significant changes, Yes, require significant changes for compliance on the industry side. What would you expect the kind of time period between publication of the final rule and the effective date. You know. So it's usually about a 90 day, I believe it's 90 days uh, from, the, from the, the actual publication of the final rule to, till its uh, initial implementation. And what we realize here is that, you know, l let's think about this, right? The National Firearms Act 1934, the Gun Control Act 1968. This is the largest overhaul of those two statutes from a regulatory perspective, you know, in 88 and 54 years, mm -hmm. respectively. And when you think about that, and you think about those statutes when they were written, and the changes that have occurred just in technology, when you think about modern manufacturing processes, materials that are used, uh, when you think about modular technology, all of these things that the industry currently uses to produce um, you know, firearms that are safe for use, right? I mean, over time, everything changes. But in 1934 and 1968, a lot of these things weren't taken into account. So it gives us an opportunity, not just from a manufacturing perspective, but also from a wholesale retail uh, perspective to make sure that we can modernize those processes that are now being used. Many of the times we're yeah. able to do variances and things of that nature. But this gives us an opportunity to make them uh, consistent across uh, across right. the industry, so people don't have to ask onesie twosie for permission of, yeah. of being able to do things in a modern. So the one thing I would say before we wrap up is, is I, I would urge ATF to consider a, a longer lead time to allow people to uh, 
change their business practices. They're going to have to write new software. Um, you know, for the record keep electronic record keeping, 90 days might be a challenge for people to be fully online no and fully compliant. So I would suggest a little bit more time for folks to to organize because they can't even do that till they see the final rule. And obviously, right, right. you're not going to give us a copy of the final rule in advance. You can't. So. Um, but you know, we're out of time. I want to thank you, Marvin, for, for sure. joining me this morning. And again, thank you to ATF for being here at the SHOT Show uh, and uh, come, you know, bringing a lot of people answer questions, doing the town hall today, yes. meeting with industry members uh, on you know, compliance-related issues. So thank you very much. Right. We yeah. really appreciate uh, the partnership. Uh, and it's good to see you again. Thank you. Definitely. And happy right. birthday. <laughs> thank you, Larry. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care. Thanks. That's all we have for you right now, folks. Enjoy the show, and we'll see you later.